Good evening, everyone. Welcome this evening. My name is Greg Natterer. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science, and it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to welcome you here again this evening. Hope you all had a nice Easter weekend. It certainly was beautiful, sunny weather. Some of you probably thought that spring was on its way, like me. Dose of reality, I guess, with the snow coming today back again. So it's, uh, it was a false hope, I guess. So thank you for coming out and supporting our Speaking of Engineering lecture series. This is uh, an event that we have at least a few times per semester, and it's, uh, it's an important part of our faculty. And I'd like to extend special greetings this evening to our guest speaker, Dr. Ray Guzine, to my left, who many of you, of course, will know, Vice President Research Pro Tempore at Memorial. I'd like to also acknowledge Jeff Emberly, uh, who is the CEO and Registrar of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Newfoundland and Labrador. Jeff will come up a little later to speak about Peganel's sponsorship of this lecture series. This session, in fact, is co-sponsored by Peganel. Peganel is an organization with the mandate of regulating engineering and geoscience professions in the province in the public interest. It has approximately 4,000 members, and we are grateful for Peganel's support of this lecture series. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, in, the in, ca in the case of an emergency, uh, let's please exit this room calmly through the back. Uh, there are two exits uh, of this room at the back. We should turn right and then go through the main exit of the building, um, through the front foyer, and then turn left. Muster Station, Lot 22, which is just across the road from business. There are also washrooms in the lobby as you turn left as you exit this room. So this lecture series that we have in engineering uh, aims to raise the awareness of engineering issues among students and the community of broader interest to the general public. We are very proud of the work that, that goes on here within the faculty uh, by our professors, students, and in fact, just a few weeks ago, we had a uh, charity ball event. So each, each year, many of you will know that engineering students organize a charity fundraiser. And this year was another exceptional success where our students raised $19,000 for the um, Autism Society of Newfoundland and Labrador in the 11th annual charity ball event. So just one of the many examples of how we're proud of our students. Tonight's lecture is about hydraulic fracking and the implications that it has in western Newfoundland. In October 2014, an independent panel was appointed by the Minister of Natural Resources of the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador to conduct a public review of the socioeconomic and environmental implications of hydraulic fracturing in western Newfoundland. Mandate of the panel also was to make recommendations on whether or not hydraulic fracturing should be undertaken in western Newfoundland. Tonight, Dr. Ray Guzine, who was the chair of the independent public panel, will provide an overview of hydraulic fracturing operations in the context of our province. He will be discussing the review processes that were developed by the panel and present the 2016 findings of the panel and the recommendations to the government. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Guzine is the Vice President of Research Pro Tempore at Memorial. He holds engineering degrees from Memorial and Cambridge University. He was formerly Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science here at Memorial and just on a personal note, um, has been a very special and, and wise mentor to me. He currently serves on the boards of directors of the Health Research Ethics Authority and the Canadian Engineering Accreditation Board. He has served as a chair of the Peganel Board and is also a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and Engineers Canada. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Guzine this evening.
Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. This uh, Speaking of Engineering series was uh, initiated in my first year when I was dean, which was in uh, 2003. So it took 14 years to get an invitation to actually come and speak at it. So I'm, I'm very, uh, very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to speak tonight about uh, the panel, as Greg mentioned, the uh, Newfoundland Labrador Hydraulic Fracturing Review Panel, which uh, was uh, tasked by government uh, to look at a, a, the, the issue of hydraulic fracturing in western Newfoundland. There will be a little bit of technical um, content to the talk, but really what I thought was perhaps most interesting was to lay out the context for the review talk a bit about how as an academic panel, because we were all uh, the five members on the panel are academics, and, and tonight I'm joined here by Wade Locke, who was uh, a member of the panel, and I asked Wade if, if there are questions that he'd like to uh, chime in on by all means to, to add to the discussion. Uh, but how we approached the task, which was, um, I guess our task was very undefined, and uh, how we went through and, and structured a review process to arrive at what we feel were um, solid recommendations that, uh, that I think mapped a way forward. And then to reflect a little at the end on what's happened since the panel filed this report. So um, I think I've got it. Yeah. So the, the members of the panel, just so you know who we were, um, as I said, I was the chair. Morris Dussault is uh, an expert in hydraulic fracturing. Uh, from the University of Waterloo. Graham Gagnon is a uh, NSERC uh, research chair in water at Dalhousie. Uh, Kevin Keogh, former vice president research chair at Memorial, uh, former chief scientist to Health Canada, a biochemist now working in uh, the research uh, administration world in Alberta. And then finally, a uh, man who needs no introduction, Dr. Wade Locke, uh, economist uh, here in the province. Uh, part of our Faculty of Humanities, Social Science, and Head of Economics at Memorial. So in November 2013, the Minister of Natural Resources announced that no applications for onshore or onshore to offshore petroleum exploration using hydraulic fraction would be accepted by government. At the time, there were, there were a number of licenses in western Newfoundland uh, that were issued for conventional oil and gas exploration. Uh, and there was talk, maybe more than talk, about going back into at least one of those wells to hydraulically fracture the well. So they were licenses that were there for conventional oil and gas. The work that had been done by the uh, license holders didn't indicate that conventional approaches would likely produ uh, produce, uh, uh, result in a producing uh, field. And so there was uh, proposals, at least drafted, to go and, and hydraulically fracture the well to see if that technique would lead to a, a better flow of oil and gas. That led to opposition, uh, not least of which was because of uh, talk about fracking in Grossmore Park, which if you're going to pick a place to go with a, um, a uh, controversial technology, why do you pick a national park and a world historic site? But anyway, that's what they chose to do, and it got a lot of attention uh, and uh, mobilized a lot of opposition. As a result of that, uh, there was uh, the government of the day undertook a review of its of regulations pertaining to oil and gas development, in particular looking at those regulations in the context of you know, how well they would serve uh, hydraulic fracturing. They completed some technical work necessary to understand the geology of western Newfoundland better than it was understood and they uh, undertook to uh, engage a public consultation process, which uh, was what our panel was ultimately uh, tasked to do. And all of those things were to be done before uh, any decisions would be taken by government with respect to proceeding with hydro hydraulic fracturing. So the situation in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, Western Newfoundland in particular, was that there was a pause um, in the administ administrative pause, is how we describe it in the, pa in the report, on accepting applications uh, for hydraulic fracturing from proponents. It's unlike the situation that existed at the same time in both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia where, to varying degrees, there were legislative moratoria in place which would have required a different kind of unwinding to get um, 
any kind of development to proceed. In the case of Nova Scotia, it, there was conditions set by the government that would need to be met and met to the satisfaction of their, uh, their government uh, through, the, through their house. So the situation here was different. It was a pause. It was a pause made as an operational decision by the Department of Natural Resources. The terms of reference for the panel included a mandate was to conduct a public review, and there was some guidance as to what that meant, and to advise the minister on the socioeconomic and envir environmental implications of hydraulic fracturing. It was uh, isolated to Western Newfoundland. Or the geography was, uh, was described as Western Newfoundland. It was clear it was not conventional oil and gas development in that same resource. It was unconventional. And we were also asked to make a recommendation uh, of whether or not hydraulic fracturing should be undertaken. So they wanted a yes or no answer, or at least they, they gave us the latitude to give them a yes or no answer. Just to orient, orient you, if, and maybe nobody here needs really the orientation, but on the left-hand side is a conventional oil well, extends into a, a reservoir. The reservoir would have accumulated oil and gas from source rocks that would have if you like, driven the oil and gas to a, a pocket or to, into reservoir rocks where the oil would flow, and then one or a small number of uh, wells would extend into the resource and draw the oil and gas out of the well. So that's kind of the scenario that we have offshore, where we have a relatively small number of platforms, multiple wells per platform, but they go into a, a reservoir and draw large volumes of oil and gas from a relatively small number of wells. The uh, image on the left is fracking, hydraulic fracturing. The well looks similar, it cuts through the aquifer, goes deep into the, into the earth. The difference being that the oil and gas is trapped in an uh, impermeable rock, so it's not flowing nicely. And uh, the approach is to fracture through the well um, to fracture the rock, and by fracturing the rock, it allows the oil and gas that is in the pores to then flow and flow into the well bore. And then that's in the case of oil pumped up to the surface. There's a fair amount of surface activity that goes on associated with the fracturing of the well and, and the recovery of water that's used to fracture and so on. I'll talk a little bit about that. The difference being that a small number of wells can access a large volume of oil conventionally but you need a large number of wells to access each well accessing a much smaller volume of oil. And so it's really the intensity of the industrial activity and in part the nature of the industrial activity, but certainly the intensity of it is a big factor in, in the impacts of hydraulic fracturing. So just to end with the last maybe technical slide, this is, just shows non-porous, non-permeable rock porous, non-permeable, meaning there's pores with the blue representing where the oil and gas would be, but it's not con they're not connected, so they're, they're trapped, and then porous and permeable. So the idea with fracturing is that if you have rock that's something like what you'd have in the middle, by fracking or putting high water at high pressure, you would create this permeability and allow the oil and gas to flow. The fracking only occurs, the, the fracturing only occurs local to the well bore, so within maybe 150 meters either side of the, the well. So the oil that will flow into the well is, is really very local to the well bore. So you need lots of them to cover the same geography or geology that you might uh, extract oil and gas from conventionally. I'm gonna, I see uh, Elliot Burden from our Earth Science Department in the back, so I'm going to apologize before I talk too much about geology to him, but I think I'm probably still safe in my explanation. So uh, fracking, uh, this is an illustration of, um, it's, uh, you know, it illustrates the concerns, I guess. Lots of surface activity, storage of chemicals, storage of water that's flowed back that contains uh, chemicals in the water, trucking the chemicals around, close proximity to homes and wells and aquifers and bringing large number of wells through aquifers and then fracturing, and in this case, fracturing in what it would appear to be very close to the aquifer and therefore the fractures would allow the oil, the gas, the chemicals to leak into the drinking water and cause all the problems people are, are concerned about. So then to do that on any kind of economic scale you need to have over a small surface area many, many wells and so it changes dramatically the nature of the, the uh, landscape and 
transform a relatively rural area to an industrial area. This is you know, not how it's currently done. It's, it, there's lots of things that are done to minimize the impacts, but the impacts are, are still more significant than they would be for conventional oil and gas. And again, you know, in, in certainly in our context, the oil and gas would be at great depth. It would be offshore. And therefore, the idea that, or the notion that the fractures would connect into any kind of uh, aquifer was not the situation that was being looked at for Western Newfoundland, although it didn't stop it from being the concerns that people had. So one of the concerns, uh, and the panel was kind of fraught from the time it was announced with, with uh, you know, people uh, suspicious of us, a uh, bunch of eggheads at the university. Right, what do they know about any of this stuff? Um, all men. Right, the, you know, the composition of the panel was had questions about it. What, why couldn't have a different balance? Um, mine's made up. Right, got a guy on there who has a patent in fracking, and uh, you know he's clearly wants to figure out a way to get fracking. He turned out to be, uh, you know, as hard nosed as I've seen anybody in dealing with industry when the proponents came forward in terms of holding them to account for anything they told us. So, you know, there were lots of concerns and we had to try and get on and do our work notwithstanding the suspicions around us. One of the suspicions was that we were going to finesse this term hydraulic fracturing. That we were just going to look at, you know, you got three engineers, an economist, and a guy who might know something about health, but nobody's really sure because he's not a doctor, to Kevin Keogh. Uh, we're going to focus on this little bit down here, which is the, tech, the technical piece of fracturing the rock. And can that be done safely? And if we can say yes to that, then everything's good to go. So we went back, and one of the first things we did is we went back to our mandate. And while hydraulic fracturing wasn't really clearly defined, there were lots of things that we were asked to consider. So we created a definition for hydraulic fracturing operations as we were going to, to address them. And they included everything from exploration activities on the front end, development of the infrastructure, so the, the creation of all those well sites and the, the moving of equipment in and out to, to construct access roads and pipelines and everything, through to the considering the storage and transportation and you know, the whole notion of, well, you need a port, and where's the port going to be, and how far away is the port, and what's that going to mean for transportation costs and transportation impacts, the drilling and construction of the well itself, this thing, this well completion and stimulation, the fracking piece of it, the, what people think about as fracking, the thing that people thought we were just going to focus on, and then through to production, re-entry of wells when they go into a decline and they stop producing, you can go back in and stimulate more production, and then finally decommissioning abandonment, and then finally restoring sites. So we looked at to the extent a group of volunteers with limited resources can look at, we looked at the process for the cradle to grave. So the work of the panel uh, concentrated mostly on issues relevant to the health and well-being of the people and the environment uh, within Western Newfoundland. Uh, the review process we considered in excess of 800 different documents, which included 600 written submissions from a public call for input. And to put that in context, the Nova Scotia review that was kind of just ended before we started um, had something on the order of 400 submissions. So, you know, the process that we constructed, we, feel, we felt, uh, was uh, inviting of input and uh, facilitated strong engagement by those who wish to engage. We were also, uh, sorry, we also were informed through public consultation sessions. We held three town hall meetings out in western Newfoundland, one in uh, Stephenville, one out in Port-a-Port, Port-a-Port uh, Port East, uh, which was a cultural experience, I think, for all of us. It had singing, dancing, um, art. People expressed their opinions in ways that you, certainly going into this process, I would have never contemplated. People would have chose to express how they felt about uh, these, this matter. And then finally, uh, in Cornerbrook. Uh, we were also open to any other group or individuals who wanted to meet with us, and so there were a whole host of other meetings, including with the proponent, 
uh, including with um, uh, the Petroleum Services Association of Canada, uh, CAP. Right? So there, was a, there were a range of meetings that we had, small subcommittees of the, or subgroups of the panel to really engage anybody who wished to engage us. So we, we really made ourselves available. We also recognized the limits of our, you know, the five of us had certain expertise, but we didn't have everything to cover that covered the map of the issues that we were asked to, to address. So we also then engaged, we engaged help where we felt we needed it. And for example, there were no geoscientists on the panel. So we engaged Elliot uh, Burden, who's at the back here, uh, who's an expert in the geology of Western Newfoundland, in particular does his research out in this area. Uh, and we also engaged experts out of the University of uh, Calgary, uh, Canada Research Chair in seismology induced anonymous uh, seismicity. So looking at induced earthquakes, which is a big concern about hydraulic fracturing. So we went out and got experts in that to help us and a whole range of others. So just to give you a sense of what we did, we didn't have any medical expertise per se, we had help. So we went out and got the chief former public health officer of Canada involved, deputy chief. Uh, we got uh, Bernie Goldstein, who's uh, in the Marcellus, who is an expert in um, public health as it relates to fracking. So he's, he was on the Canadian Academy's panel that the federal government commissioned to look at the impacts of, of shale gas. He's done an awful lot of work around the Marcellus on the impacts. The thing to bear in mind about health impacts is that impacts can be positive and negative, right? There are things that may be improved in health as a result of industrial activity because of the wealth that's created and the ability for people to, to, uh, to do more with uh, the resources they have. And then there's other impacts that may be negative. So we were looking at, you know, in terms of health, certainly engaging people who could help us understand the impacts, both positive and negative from a development. We had uh, great help here from the Faculty of Engineering, Faisal Khan, uh, Valet Chair, now Canada Research Chair in Safety and Risk Engineering, helped us work through some of the safety and risk aspects of the, uh, of the, of the mandate. Tahir Hussain, a Professor in Environmental Engineering, uh, helped deal with some water quality, air quality issues. Uh, we didn't have any law expertise, so we had to go to Dalhousie. We went to Dalhousie and we got a, an individual there, Bill Leahy, uh, the Schulich School of Law, expert in environmental regulation and health law. And then we had, uh, while Wade was on the panel, we made a decision that rather than have Wade do the economics uh, analysis, we would commission and have others do it and then the panel could look at it critically. So rather than Wade coming in with an analysis and the three engineers and the medical guy going, looks good, Wade, <laughs> looks great, but we, don't, we can't look at it critically, we had help from our own Department of Economics, but also from some consultants to look at both the, uh, the project um, economics and then the fiscal impacts on the province. And then because we had so much input, the 600 submissions and the, the uh, input that we received at the, uh, at the public sessions, while you could read it uh, and get a sense of what people were saying for sure, we uh, wanted to have somebody take, a, again, a critical look at that. So we got Keith Story at Memorial um, in, the, in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Science to go in and actually do a, a rigorous disciplined analysis of what we were being told. So he, he went in and he actually analyzed the, the scripts and pulled out keywords and then and, and looked at giving us, a, I guess, a more scientific assessment of what the narratives had told us. One other thing we did to, because we thought we were going to get, or we, as we were getting the input in, it looked like it was kind of coming from one end of the spectrum, the people who were opposed. We decided to do a public opinion survey and have the professional company undertake that survey to try and see what would a, an independent survey lead by way, or give us by way of input if the individuals didn't have to come and step forward you know, in front of uh, a microphone, in front of a hostile audience which was what these sessions were generally like, and stand up and voice uh, an opinion that perhaps wasn't uh, popular in the room. Or we, we had made a commitment to make every, everything available publicly in the, in, in the interest of being transparent. We said every piece of input that we get to this process, we're going to make public. And uh, so that might mean people who have unpopular opinions 
uh, might be reticent to step forward and put their name on something. If you're a truck driver on the Port of Port Peninsula, you may not want to say you're in favor of fracking when everybody else in your community has written in saying they don't like it, for instance. So we did a public opinion survey, had it done independent of the panel, did it broadly across the island, focused, oversampled in western Newfoundland to, for statistical significance, and then looked, had a key story, look at those results compared to what his analysis did to see what the differences are. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. So just to orient you, the Greenpoint Shale is the gray area on the, this is Western Newfoundland, Port of Port Peninsula is down at the bottom. The extent of the Greenpoint Shale is roughly, well, it's uh, around the northern rim of Port of Port Bay, extends up under the ocean up to, uh, starts to come here at Greenpoint, in fact, that's, I think, where Greenpoint is, uh, Elliot. Uh, it comes on shore at Greenpoint, and if you go on, to, if you go to Greenpoint, which is kind of in the middle of Grosmont Park, you will see this. Uh, there's a picture later. You see this undulating, folded. It's almost like paper. I, mean, I had never seen a, a rocks that were almost like the, a rough cut spine of a book. And when you when you uh, broke the the shale in your hand and, and smelled it, you could smell the oil in it. Um, so it extends then up through Grossmorn Park, here the green, and then on up the northern peninsula some distance. And up here it's under the land, it's kind of under land and offshore in Grossmorn, and it's out under the ocean in, uh, as, it, as you go down south to, to um, Port of Port. The most extensive discussion that we found, and I think that exists, is in a report called the uh, Greenpoint Shale of Western Newfoundland. That was the report that was done, uh, referenced by government as being the, the extensive study that they would do following the, uh, putting a pause on the uh, development. So the Greenpoint Shale report was an extensive piece of work done looking at this uh, resource, but also in the context of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, one of the things we did to, uh, I guess, because we were focused um, geographically and we had uh, data available, we decided to approach the question of whether or not something, you know, hydraulic fracturing should proceed. We decided to approach it by taking, a, developing a, a scenario. Okay, well, let's think about if we were to develop that resource, what would that look like in terms of a development project? What would it look like in terms of an economic return at various prices of oil. Uh, there was a fair amount of information available. This licensed EL 1070 and EL 1120. There were, this was the, this is a Port of Port Peninsula, Port of Port Bay. There's, a, there are a couple, there's an oil well uh, on the tip of uh, Shoal Point, which is uh, the, the protrusion of land in the middle of the bay. The, uh, there had been some work done estimating the amount of recoverable oil in the EL 1070 and EL 1120 licenses. So we knew to some, well, we had an estimate how reliable it was. It's a, it's a, it was a, an estimate of recoverable oil. So it's a pretty speculative estimate. But nevertheless, between the gray area in this 11, 1070 license, so in this area here around Port of Port Bay, and in this hash marked area on uh, the EL 1120 license, there was estimated to be 428 million barrels of oil. So we figured then if we look at using conventional but unconventional, so sort of current approaches to unconventional oil and gas development, onshore wells that would go down and extend out underneath the ocean and drain the resource you know, from the land, then if you could look at putting a series of wells around Port of Port Bay, you could access most or much of what was in this EL 1070 license. And so we looked at, well, what would that look like as a development project? What would it look like from the point of view of economic return? So this is what, you know, something would look like. Each of these is a well pad, each of these rectangles. You would put a series of wells out. They would extend out uh, five kilometers out in, a, in several layers because the shale is thought to be quite deep in the, in the wells. Again, you're, you're only draining oil from within a, within a small 
radius around the uh, well bore, so you'd need multi levels of wells, and you would need uh, wells that would be these are two and a half kilometers long, so you'd need to extend it, reach drilling, and you could go five kilometers. And if you did that, and if you looked at putting more of these around the bay, you would be able to access pretty much all of the oil that is thought to be in that resource. Um, so, that, so we took that approach, and we backed off a little. We figured, well, let's, let's make it a little simpler than that. So we developed a scenario. We looked at 480 wells on 30 to 40 sites, so there would be well pads in 40 different locations around that bay. So, you know, fair density of well pads, and then on each pad there'd be 12 to 15 wells. Each well would be two kilometers long, so somewhat shorter than the two and a half kilometer long uh, well, and certainly there wouldn't be two layers of them. So we're, we're looking at getting the oil that's nearer the shore. It would be cheaper to do that. Extended reach drilling is more expensive. There was capacity to drill 80 wells per year if you brought in the, in the equipment needed to develop all these wells. You could do about 80 a year. Uh, and so it would take six years to drill and complete all 480 wells. Each well would require about 4 million gallons of water, 5,000 tons of sand. And when you pump the water down and fracture the rock, some of that water flows back. It gushes back up the well bore, and it's called flowback. So there would be about half of the water that would go down to fracture the well would, would flow back up. And that's kind of an average number. It could vary from 30 to 70 percent, depending on the res the resource. So we picked sort of the middle of the pack. We estimated that each well would take 20 years to, or would produce for 20 years. So once it's fractured, it would be drawing oil out of the well for about 20 years. And the 480 production wells would drain approximately 282 square kilometers. And that, as a fraction of the total area in the license, would let you recover approximately 150 million barrels of oil of the 428 that were estimated to be there. So you're not getting it all. You would need to do more development to get it all. But you can kind of scale up the cost. If you wanted to get 300 million barrels, you can double your number of wells, you can double your amount of sand, you can double your amount of water. So this kind of was a big enough project, perhaps to make it economical, or at least to assess its e economics, uh, and do it without each well being prohibitively priced. Everything gets more expensive from this scenario, I guess is what I'm saying, per well. So this is probably the cheapest per well cost that you would have. This would also produce uh, 75 billion standard cubic feet of gas and 115 million barrels of produced water. So in addition to the 2 million gallons of water that would flow back from each of the 480 wells it's kind of almost immediately after you fracture, as you're producing over 20 years, each of these uh, production wells will also produce a fraction of water. So you're going to get oil, gas, and water flowing back. And the estimates of the amount of water was based on some data that had been um, uh, have been recovered from some of the work that the proponent had done in their drilling. So they were based on reasonable, they were reasonable estimates of the, the amount of water, the amount of gas, and the amount of oil that you'd have as, as uh, fractions from that particular geology. So then we, so that was the scenario. So then we looked at the benefits. The benefits being, if you like, the money and what the money lets you do. Um, again, keep in mind that these benefits uh, you're, you're developing these wells over six years, so you're not getting a lot of production early on. So you're deferring your benefits. You know, anything you're going to buy, you're going to be buying likely in the future. <laughs> so it's over the next 20 years uh, when, you're, when you're in full production that you're going to get your, your most significant benefits. But we looked at what it would mean and, as an average, what it means. So, so we looked at the 150 million barrels recoverable. We looked at it at varying price levels, but for $85 a barrel, which is not the price today in case anybody is, is uh, following oil prices, uh, the net present value for a project using a reasonable discount rate was between one and two point two and a quarter billion dollars. That included building in uh, an amount for Nalcor, and we had Nalcor as an equity partner uh, consistent with the energy plan of the day uh, Nalcor would play a role basically as a, the eyes and ears of the province on a development project. 
So they were in as an equity partner. Um, the provincial, um, so th this would mean, sorry, I'm backing up here. 1 1.1 to 2.25 billion would translate over the period of time to, uh, uh, sorry, provincial government revenue from the tax, the royalties, and the profits associated with the project over the 26-year life would be between 2 and $3.5 billion, or average to be 84 to $136 million per year. So the average returns to the government from all of its sources would be between 84 and $136 million a year. The federal government revenues from corporate income tax would be uh, between 630 and 900 or a billion dollars, or 24 to 38 million per year. And then we also built in a revenue sharing model, which meant that some of the, res some of the returns would go very locally into the, into the Port of Port Peninsula, into the communities, and that varied between a quarter of a million and a, bill and a million dollars uh, per year locally. So what's that mean? Uh, in the year that we did this, the provincial government revenues were in the order of $6.8 billion. So the fiscal impact of the project, the 84 to 136 million, would be in the order of 1.2 to 2% of revenues. So while that's not insignificant, clearly it's not insignificant, um, it certainly is a very small portion of the revenues that would be associated with offshore oil and gas activity. So, you know, as a as an offshore as a oil and gas project, it would be a very minor project from the perspective of the returns to the province and revenues. And we don't know whether there's, there is more than a project out there. This is what they know is the Greenpoint Shale, and for all kinds of reasons, it gets complicated to develop uh, the resource up around Grossmont Park, for instance. It's you, you're out you, to access the resource. You have to be further offshore as you start to come south. So the, the rim around Port of Port Bay, because you can access the land and from land access the resource, is probably the most economical piece to develop. Uh, and so whether this, whether the Greenpoint Shale is ever any more than a project, whether it could become an industry out there, that's an un, a big unknown. Um, but anyway, this project, while not an insignificant source, would be a relatively minor contributor to the, to, in terms of royalties and profit sharing to the province. To put that in context, the provincial revenues, this 84 to 136 million, if this is nothing more than revenue, a revenue source, it would be comparable to the revenues that the province gets from lotteries, or from vehicle and driver's license fees, or from tobacco tax, or from insurance company tax. All of those are kind of in that same 84 to 136 million dollar range. So if all you want to do is generate $136 million in the province, you can either go out and take on Grossmorn Park and every actor in the country, or you can double the tobacco tax. So that kind of is the scale of activity. If there's nothing more than revenue, now there are, there are other considerations beyond revenue, but that's the revenue story. So we phrase this as, in terms of provincial revenues anyway, the illustrative project, while could be important to Western Newfoundland under certain revenue sharing models, couldn't be considered a game changer with respect to the fiscal position of the province. So there was no overriding provincial, um, there was nothing compelling the province to do this. This wasn't going to change the province, unlike what's happened with the province in offshore oil and gas. I know you can't read this from, probably I can't read it from here, so I can't imagine any of you can read This is other benefits which are jobs. So we looked at the direct, indirect, and induced jobs that would be associated with a couple of different scenarios. One would be where you're disposing of um, uh, the water, the produced water in deep wells. So you're taking the water and you're, and you're injecting it into a deep well and leaving it, leaving it in place. or you're treating it off-site in a water treatment facility, taking it up to some standard, and then discharging it into the ocean, or anyway, discharging it. During construction, so to kind of roll this up, in the Stephenville Port of Port area, we would be looking at about 312 jobs annually during the six years of construction associated with the development. 
and about 1,000 or 1,100 jobs provincially. There will be lots of other jobs elsewhere in the country. Uh, most of the equipment would be from elsewhere. Lots of people would be coming in and working from elsewhere. But the local impacts would be on the order of 300 in the direct region and provincially 1,100. Once you run out of the construction phase and into production, these are pretty lean operations to, you know, you need a man and a dog, right? You need the man to feed the dog and the, the dog to keep the man from touching the equipment, right? It's, there's not a lot going on. There's a well that needs tending to on occasion. So in production, the local impacts on the order for this project under this scenario were estimated to be on the order of 40 jobs. And then in the province on the order of 72. So when you're talking that, that's quite a small impact. Now you're starting to talk about what, you know, when you hear people say, well, I'm concerned about the impact on, on tourism, right? You start to say, well, okay, well, how many tourism jobs are in that region and what's the, what might be the trade-off? And it wouldn't take much of a knock you know, if you had a 10% impact, if 10% of the tourists stopped going to Gross Morn, which is the single largest uh, destination in the province, it swamps everything else combined. If you hit that by 10%, you lose an equivalent to all these jobs anyway. So, uh, you know, that was part of our analysis in, at a, you know, in a very coarse way, but points to a need to look at this stuff in much more detail, the, the intersection of this industry with other industries in the region. So those were the, the benefits, the money and the jobs. Uh, the risks, are really they're issues, because risks you need to know more than we knew. You need to understand the probability of something happening and the consequence of it happening to really assess the risk. But the issues that we, you know, we came aware of, largely through the public consultation and, and reading and so on, but the things that people were concerned about, Potential negative impacts on climate change over time from natural gas leakage from many, many wells that, you know, almost certainly will have some seepage, you know, as they age and concrete breaks down and so on. What's the impact on climate change? Uh, possible stress on the capacity of local water supplies. You need large volumes of water. Um, you don't think Newfoundland has a water problem or a water supply problem, although Western Newfoundland on the Port of Port Peninsula has water challenges and many communities out there are on perpetual boil water orders as they are you know, around, around the province. So the water resources, uh, the analysis that was done by Graham Gagnon from Dalhousie actually showed that there are some significant water stresses in the Port of Port Western Newfoundland region. So you'd have to bring, likely have to bring the water from somewhere else, somewhere else in the province, but you'd probably have to pipeline it or transport it from some distance from port to port to be able to, uh, to be able to provide the volumes that were needed. Of course, you know, you're on the ocean, so why can't you use seawater? Well, then you're into the need to deal with um, you know, preparing that, and you just can't pump it out and start to use it to frack. It will affect equipment, and it needs the interaction between the, the salt water and the various chemicals, you know, all need to be, uh, it all needs to be, um, becomes a treatment problem and that becomes a cost. So you know, there was no free salt water solution. Um, there was a poor understanding of the local geology and the potential risks associated with the contamination of local drinking water supplies. That was certainly a concern people had, although the hydraulic fracturing, the fracking itself was occurring offshore, but there was going to be a lot of surface transportation and the possibility of spills from trucks and so on, which would have certainly raise concerns about local drinking water. Uh, surface water contamination, uh, land disturbances, and then seismicity, right, earthquakes. And those, again, as we were doing our work nationally and internationally, the thought was moving that the only issue for seismicity was the reinjection of water. So if you could avoid reinjecting water into deep wells, which would cause those wells to, to pressurize and, crack and fracture and perhaps induce some major, uh, major earthquakes. It's, and the initial thinking was that the fracking itself was not triggering 
this anomalous induced seismicity. But as the year and a bit went on as we were doing our work, studies started to show that, in fact, the fracking itself was now causing uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, events that caused shutdowns out in, in Western Canada in particular. So those are the environmental issues. Uh, there were public health issues that m many of them followed from the uh, environmental issues. Exposure to airborne toxicants, degradation of water quality, exposure to wastewater and, ha water and hazardous fluids, and just a general anxiety. I mean, when you went out there and met people, there was a real anxiety of people of not knowing what this will mean to them. And, uh, uh, you know, other cumulative effects, I guess, of, uh, of uh, the, the risks that they, they didn't understand and didn't understand how it, would, how it would impact them over time. And then socioeconomic issues, possible stress on the healthcare and social services systems as a result of boomtown effects. Certainly, it's a very, it's very rural Newfoundland for sure out there, and so this would change the nature of the place and the, the demographic of, uh, of people. Uh, negative impacts on other economic sectors. How does it intersect with, intersect with fishery, tourism, and agriculture? Negative effects on other uses of land and water. And right through, I guess, the bottom one, you know, lack of confidence in government. You know, there, was, there was not a degree of trust. We weren't trusted. Uh, in fact, we would say to people, you, we're not here asking you to trust us. We're asking you to cooperate with us. And you know, when we release our report, Use that and decide if you subsequently trust us. But you know, at this stage, just you know, just give us your cooperation. We're trying to understand uh, what is it that's concerning you. This is a visit we made to uh, Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. So there was the benefits, or the potential benefits, the jobs, and the money. There were the risks that derive from the issues that were raised, and then there's the scale. And this was perhaps the most revealing piece of all of this is that people didn't understand the scale of what would be impacting them if there was to be a hydraulic fracturing industry in the region. So this is an aerial view of an area that we went in uh, Pennsylvania. So a sense of what's going on here. There's a series of well pads in, throughout the countryside, a series of connector roads, a series of right-of-ways, pipelines, and, and transportation right-of-ways. Um, what I will say, uh, you know, we went down, we were in, I guess it was the Appalachians, and it was very impressive how you could drive through the countryside and from the roads not see any of this. It was very nicely done. Right? Now that's today, I think things, you know, in the early days of fracking perhaps weren't so nicely done. And so if, you, if you're uh, inclined to think that gas land is accurate, it was probably accurate in its day, but it is not the way fracking is done down there today. Um, but of course, Newfoundland and Labrador has a particular uh, flair for industrial scarring like nobody else does, right? So we don't really hide our, our activity very well. So uh, the other thing on the Port of Port Peninsula is uh, a major quarry, which if you look at the Port of Port Peninsula from the air, it looks like it's kind of covering you know, a quarter of the peninsula. So, you know, certainly modern fracking and in the Pennsylvania area is a very discreet activity. When it's up and running, it's, uh, you, know, you, you don't really, you don't, you don't see it. It's not, you know, getting, getting it developed is a big exercise, but, but the actual uh, activities when they're, when they're fully done, they are, they are, you know, it's a discreet uh, industry. So this is uh, the Port of Port Bay. So thinking about that scale, you would have 40 well sites around this bay here in order to develop the resources out in the bay. So we were looking at, if you go back and you look at the amount of water, the amount of sand, the, well, the amount of water you're bringing in, the amount of product you're taking out, the amount of sand you're bringing in, the amount of fluids you're bringing in, the amount of flowback water you've got to figure out how to get out. Um, what will that mean to a, a place for which there is a road onto the peninsula across a narrow sandbar, the isthmus here? There is no road, well, there's a, part, a road that kind of goes on the north side of 
this part of the bay, or sorry, the north side of the peninsula on the south part of this bay, that kind of stops there. Then there's a road to the south, and then there's a dirt road, or little more than a dirt road that takes you up, and then there is a road that takes you along here. There's really a couple of roads there. This is not like Pennsylvania, where there's lots of back roads and lots of other ways to get to you know, your sites, on and off sites. There's little infrastructure installed here to do anything more than someone to leave their, you know, their house and go to Stephenville to go to the doctor. It is a pretty elementary transportation uh, system out there. So what would it mean if you didn't upgrade that or do something very significant with the infrastructure, which will cost money, right? What it will mean if you said, we took all of the, all of the truck activity that would go on over the 26 years. So every truckload of sand, every truckload of water, every truckload of product, every movement of vehicles associated with moving the rigs around. We worked with PSAC, in fact, the Petroleum Services Association, to kind of model this. And what we came up with, and we did it and they did it, and we came up with numbers that weren't that different, would be that the total truckloads per well, so every one of the 480 wells, will be associated with about 3,300 truckloads uh, of something, right? And these are, some are very large trucks and some are you know, small dump trucks. The average number of truckloads per day during the six years of construction is about 300 or so truckloads a day. The number of truck movements a day, you double that almost, right? You bring a truck in full of you know, sand, you bring it back empty to some central site where you're going to collect your sand from. And it doesn't really matter where it's from, you still have to go back and forth to it. So the truckloads per day during construction, during the six years of construction, is 590 a day. If you have a 10-hour working day, that's a truckload a minute, truck movement a minute. And if you're living along one of these roads, you're looking at a, a truck of you know, size that they haven't seen before, probably, driving by your house once a minute. And, you know, there's not a lot you can do to mitigate that. You know, if you say, well, we'll, we'll, you know, if you compress the time, right, we won't go for 10 hours a day, we'll only go for six. Well, to get this developed in six years, now you're driving it every 30 seconds. I mean, there's not, there aren't many parameters that let you take current port-to-port -port peninsula and make anybody happy. Are you any happier if you have an, a double articulated truck going every five minutes? It probably, ne it, you know, there isn't a, a, a number until that's out to, you know, once an hour, maybe I can live with that. But, you know, minute, three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, none of those numbers are probably going to be acceptable for the people who have to live in that for, for six years. When you move into production, the numbers more or less have. So now it's once every two minutes, or once every 15 minutes, or once every 30 minutes. So it, you know, the, the takeaway from this is that, first of all, the scale will change the place significantly, and the scale was unknown. Unfortunately, what had been set up out there were an expectation that people were thinking about a well here, at most maybe 20 wells. There was never anybody talking about 480 wells, and that 480 is really probably a minor, pro I mean, that's the low end of, we couldn't make it viable at 480, right? So, you know, that d discussion, I think quite frankly, had never been had. So there have been lots of people out trumping up the positive side of fracking, positive side of oil and gas development through fracking, but I don't think anybody had really let people understand what this was going to really look like if it got into production, or into development, I guess, in production. So those were the three issues that we, we looked at. The geology uh, is illustrated here, and this is uh, from Elliot's report. You can see it's not this nice layer cake geology that uh, is often used to illustrate fracking at its best, where you've got lots of solid, impervious rock on top of the resource. This is, this, I'm not sure, is this Greenpoint, uh, Elliot? So this is Greenpoint. You can see the, 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 uh, 
the formation comes up, folds back down on itself. Over here, you can see uh, the folding of the formation, and then I think maybe some uh, some uh, vertical formation, and then some more horizontal formation. It's a highly fold folded, faulted geology. Uh, so that's it's very unlike what fracking is typically done in. This is the area, this is from the uh, Greenpoint Shale Report. This is uh, on Long Point, a, a, a well that is on Long Point, uh, where, um, you know, one of the sites where you would look at fracking from. This green is the Greenpoint Shale Resource. And you can see in this cartoon, I guess, all of these, this quite heavy faulting and folding that's in the geology at the... Uh, at the site. The report, Elliot's report, reads, there needs to be some proof that the complex geology we see on the surface disappears at depth or at the, fo the folds and fractures we see on the surface can be modeled. There's been very little data collected, so, you know, kind of the scientists uh, among us were wondering, well, how do you model something if you don't have any appreciable amount of data? How do you model this with any degree of um, you know, accuracy that you would need to, to have to be able to, uh, to develop it. The government's own report, such high quality data would also be crucial for designing and predicting the effects of an initial hydraulic fracturing program. Need for more data. The great abundance of interconnected cross-cutting fractures, the easier it is for hydrocarbons or any fluids to leak out. So these were the kind of phrases that led us to believe that, you know, uh, not only you know, could we not see that the, that the uh, extent of the science was understood, but government's own scientists were saying that it wasn't sufficiently understood. So the primary recommendation as to whether or not hydraulic fracturing should proceed uh, was a little more complicated than a simple yes or no. Uh, we concluded that there were a number of gaps and deficiencies that needed to be addressed before it could re proceed responsibly and reasonably, and that uh, at this point we recommended that the pause that was in place uh, continue to be in place while a number of things were done. And I'm just going to hit on a couple of things that we said we, we recommend doing, you know, some of the, the bigger ticket items, I guess, and then I'll conclude with a few comments about uh, where things stand now. So we we uh, made 85 recommendations to government, some very detailed about what should be done if you get into the development or production, and then some things that needed to be done uh, very early on. And we characterized them as red, orange, and green stage uh, recommendations, red being things that you must address before you contemplate accepting any applications for fracking. The yellow, things that you can start to get ready, but you must do before you allow fracking to proceed, but you, people can start to get ready for it. And then if a decision was made to allow hydraulic fracturing to proceed, what best practices should be employed at different parts of the operation in order to feel, or in order for the panel to feel that uh, it could be done responsibly and reasonably. So I'll just hit on a couple of the red scale ones. Uh, first of all, uh, our exercise uh, certainly demonstrated that there had been a significant failing in community engagement you know, from the time of first uh, when industry and maybe industry and government and the people in western Newfoundland kind of collided on the issue that it was a bit of a disaster of, uh, of how you would engage those groups to look at a development of this kind. So, you know, there needed to be a different approach to community engagement uh, and recalibrate that and if you're going to have any hope of bringing this along. Uh, there was very little understanding, public understanding, of the scale, the risks, and the benefits of unconventional oil and gas development in the region. Um, there were, public policies were out of date. The regional economic development plans for the region the regions most effective didn't even contemplate oil and gas development in some cases, let alone hydraulic fracturing. So the aspirations that were in their regional plans were for, uh, you know, agriculture and for fishery and for uh, tourism. It was silent on this kind of technology. 
this kind of development. So, you know, and that those hadn't been looked at for years, you know, six, seven years for sure. The energy plan was out of date. The energy plan reads, you know, the only responsible way to develop Newfoundland and Labrador's resources is to do it in the context of a plan. And the plan had no reference to unconventional oil and gas development. So an update of the energy plan and to see where energy fits uh, from a public policy perspective was, was thought to be critical. Um, you know, is energy, uh, is energy a public policy matter? I mean, you know, we, there is uh, the Electricity Act, I think it is, Wade, is the act that says we will not have the development of nuclear energy in the province. It's in the act. It's public policy. So whether or not there's going to be public policy around fracking or unconventional oil and gas is something that needs to at least be considered. Um, there needs to be government investment to better understand and med mitigate uh, key risks. Um, the science is not sufficiently understood. And then finally, uh, you know, they needed to get, uh, just sort out the gross mooring issue, right? We were told early on there's to be no fracking in gross mooring park. The government told us that, I think, the first day we met them. But that was a concern people had, and I don't think it's ever been, you know, clearly stated as a position. But, you know, our recommendation was, you know, make a clear statement about gross mooring itself and then get on with the process, and there is a process. It's a, it's a, the, f the federal provincial process to develop the buffer zone. There needs to be an industrial buffer zone around Gross Morn, and that should be sorted out and dealt with in advance of uh, any development. Um, some of these are details. I guess one of the significant things, and I'll come back to this in the end, we recommended that a health impact assessment needed to be part of any evaluation moving forward. And that's not typically done. There's environmental assessments done, uh, strategic environmental assessments and mandated environmental assessments. But uh, there are no mandated health impact assessments. So that was one of our recommendations. Um, look at potential development sites from a land use perspective, looking at short-term and long-term coastal change. The two key spits of land out there, Long Point and Shoal Point, are both subject to significant erosion. Uh, at the same time we were doing our work, there was the leaking oil well off of Shoal Point, which was in the news kind of regularly. And it was an oil well that was out in the water, but had been drilled maybe 7,500 years ago on land. And coastal erosion has put the oil well out in the water. And then there becomes a debate of whether it's onshore or offshore, and who's responsible. And nobody is seen to be acting, and yet the oil well is leaking. And the, the local residents are insisting it's a leak. Uh, the speculation is that it's, no, it's not a leak. There's lots of natural seeps out there. And so they engage a consultant. And it was the day that we were out there with the group that the consultant's report was released. I guess it was AMEC or Stantec, or I forget which one did it. And what was the answer? It was a leak. It wasn't a seep. And so you know, the people out there felt that you know, we've been ignored. We were right. Nobody listens to us. Two governments then start trying to push it into the other's jurisdiction. It does nothing to build confidence that we can put 480 wells out here and anybody is going to take responsibility for the long-term consequences of it. Uh, there's a regulatory gap. Uh, the offshore CNLOPB is responsible for offshore oil and gas development. Uh, the province is responsible for onshore. Uh, this is an onshore to offshore development, so who's responsible and, you know, who's responsible for the well that goes onshore to offshore? If something happens out in the offshore, it's in one jurisdiction. If it happens, you know, at the wellhead, it's in somebody else's jurisdiction. And so that kind of needs to be at least coordinated, if not sort of fixed in a, in a larger way. I won't go into the yellow stage. A, I've got some uh, books here if you want to follow up there, it's kind of more details. What I'm going to do is just, uh, I'm going to end with a couple of slides. When we got to the end of the process, you get so immersed in this, uh, and you start to, you know, kind of believe what you write, and believe what the other members of the panel tell you, um, and what the consultants you've engaged tell you, that we decided we really needed to sort of test this before we release it, see if this holds up. So we engaged a series of reviewers uh, who had 
different perspectives to bring. So we had uh, Professor Rock Mechanics from UBC involved looking at, uh, at, the, uh, at the, uh, the engineering side of this. We had um, uh, Ed Foran, who, who helped run the Hebron public our consultation process. Um, and so he helped us look at you know, our own process, really. Uh, a young lady named Leah Fusco, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. She happened to be in some of the sessions out in Western Newfoundland. She's studying, uh, she's doing her PhD on environmental impact assessments. So you know, a young person's perspective who's got an interest in this kind of stuff. She followed us around for some of our work anyway, and then agreed to, to help us do a final review give us feedback before we release the report. We got another uh, Deputy Chief Public Health Officer of Canada to look at it from a public health perspective. Chris Loomis, former Vice President here at Memorial, uh, toxicologist, uh, was uh, engaged to look at it, uh, again, from a combination of public health and, uh, and uh, uh, impacts of chemicals on, on, on the body. Uh, John McLaughlin is uh, former president of the University of New Brunswick. He chaired the New Brunswick Review Panel, which was kind of running co coincident with ours. Axel Myerson, former president here at Memorial, who happens to be an expert uh, in, uh, in methane. Uh, but also, interestingly, he is the president of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. And of course, UNESCO is the World Heritage Site. Uh, Penny Moody Corbett, uh, School of Northern School of Medicine, former associate dean here of medicine, also uh, uh, strong on uh, human health. Uh, Tim, uh, Tom Murphy, director of the Marcellus Center of Outreach at Penn, Uni Penn State University. And then we got two people uh, from the uh, social science field, Andre Pallord, uh, dean of public affairs at Carleton. Uh, Andre did his PhD on Hibernia. And final, uh, finally, Donna Savoie, Canada Research Chair in Public Administration, uh, I think undisputedly a world authority on regional economic development uh, you know, was behind the formation of ACOA. We got him involved because uh, as we went in our report, we said this is not an oil and gas project. This is a regional economic development project. That's what the value is if it can become about regional economic development, not about energy for the province. So you know, we kind of had stepped into that and then wanted to see is, that, is our report going to hold up having taken that step. So we engaged both uh, Andre Pallord and Donald Savoie. This group was invaluable to us refining that, the final version of the report. And uh, uh, you know, on one hand, the, the process might appear like it was all well thought out and defined, but it was made up as we went along. And I think if I were to repeat it again, for the most part, we'd probably approach it, or I'd certainly approach it much the same way. We tried to be open, we tried to be transparent, we tried to engage help where we needed it. Uh, we've made everything available, every model that we ran, every spreadsheet we created to do all the modeling is on our webpage. Anybody can take it, anybody can run it, change the numbers, see if you get a better answer, criticize it. So we kind of made everything publicly available uh, for anybody who wants to kind of pick it up and either explore it academically or explore it, you know, we said to the proponent. Everything we, we've done, you can have, and if it helps you down the road, so be it. Final comments. Postscript. Uh, we released the report, government's comment at the time, thanks to the panel. Uh, they had responded very quickly um, to, re re to assemble a team to review the report. The government didn't get, the government got the report, and I would say the government had the first inclination of what the recommendation would be the same day that we released it out in Port of Port. This was not a panel that gave any previews to the government. We, they didn't want it, and to be fair to both governments, the government that commissioned us, um, or created us, the commission suggests we were paid, but we're volunteers. The, the government that created us let us have the freedom to be independent that they said there was never any uh, intervention by them. And to the credit, the government that came in I guess in some ways we thought they were ignoring us. I mean, they were, we were, they, they were, uh, they waited till we file a report. So they got it. The minister uh, put together a, a group to uh, 
to look at the recommendations. There's lots of recommendations and they intersect with lots of departments. I was speaking to um, Deputy Minister, Assistant Deputy Minister yesterday and he just updated me. These working groups are still working to address primarily the concerns that are in the red category. So they are, I think, in good faith dealing with what are some significant, significant from a work perspective anyway, maybe significant from a budget perspective, uh, recommendations that the panel made, but they they are working through them, and I guess in due course they will provide some update as to what they will do as a result. Um, what was the feedback? Uh, just a selection of things. We have you know, lots of uh, feedback after. Uh, these are just a few press clippings. Paul Barnes, CAP, uh, represents a prudent approach to shale development on the West Coast based on responsible fact-based information, so I think it was reasonably well received by, by uh, industry, at least as is represented by groups like CAP. Um, the uh, locally, the uh, Port Corporation felt it laid out a way forward, so it, you know, we certainly didn't close off something that the Port Corporation had certainly communicated an importance to us. And then uh, one of the most, uh, I guess, um, significant individuals in terms of opinion leaders in, in Western Newfoundland was a former doctor or doctor, but former practicing uh, doctor in the area. Ian Simpson, who, uh, who again was uh, was positive about uh, not just the, what the report did, but the the uh, particular re health recommendations that the report provided. So my final slide is actually just from last week. And if any of you have followed the federal government, the federal government has just um, put forward a report on an expert panel on the review of environmental assessment processes. And so the EA process that uh, you know, is a normal part of any major development in Canada is under review, was under, still is under review, but was, was, was this panel filed a report. And it was really filed, or what they concluded, and this is part of what the, this is an extract. You know, it, it's a report that re makes recommendations largely based on the loss of confidence that the public has in environmental assessment processes. And so what they heard resoundingly from Canadians was the need for an, an, uh, an environmental assessment process to move beyond the biophysical environment to encompass all impacts, both positive and negative, so it's not all doom and gloom, it's looking at what does this development do positively and negatively on health, on environment, on culture, on economy. Um, so social issues, economic opportunities, health impacts, and cultural concerns. Uh, it should move beyond economic or environmental impact to impact assessment, and uh, it should be all-encompassing. So in many respects, when we look at what is now just a week ago recommended to the federal government for their own overarching processes, in many respects they align very nicely, I think, with what our process concluded after we kind of got into it and moved, you know, made it up as we went along, but moved away from what seemed to be a fairly narrow focus on fracturing a rock. So um, my final comment will be, uh, so I'm an engineer, this is speaking of engineering, I know there's probably lots of disciplines in the audience, but I must say that um, going into this process, you, you know, kind of was a bit overwhelming, just, you know, I, at points, I know I'm not, a, I'm not a civil engineer. There were lots of times when I wish this could have just been about the rock. Right? It just got complicated, and the human side of it got really complicated. But engineering wasn't a bad degree to have to be a member of this panel. You, you, know, um, you know, the science, you could at least understand what was coming at you. The economics, the numbers didn't bother you. Or, you know, it, you know, the uh, engineering was fine. The social piece, you know, when I look back on what we do in the program, kind of wish there had been a little more. Uh, but, you know, all, all said, if you can't have everything, an engineering degree wasn't a bad degree to have to be tasked with getting on and undertaking this sort of task. So uh, that's a comment I, I'd uh, kind of leave uh, in the, my final comment, and I guess it's, it's, our, it's targeted to engineers, that, you know, the engineering of this became the least of the issues. And it was the least of the issues probably within minutes of the panel being announced because immediately it got, got sucked into all the other uh, 
uh, all the other matters kind of dominated. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Dr. Gozai. Ray, that certainly was very informative, very interesting. We will have time for questions now. And uh, w what I'd like to ask is if you could put up your hand and then either I or maybe Jackie will walk around and we'll have this microphone so that everyone will be able to hear your question. Uh, the original report was based on, I think, $85 per barrel oil. Is there a number now where the project would be economically viable? And I say that because in the U.S. they float around the concept of 55 to $60 or $50 as, as the, the bottom end of a fracking project. So although 85 was used at the time, it was probably because the price of oil was predicted at that. What would be the bottom number where it would, or the start, where it would be economically viable to go ahead with fracking? So. 85, so we, we ran the model that we did, the modeling of the project, at uh, $50, uh, 85, and 100. Um, so we, I mean, I'll let Wade comment. We didn't try and pick an oil price that made it viable. We ran three scenarios and then developed those same numbers, right? The, the revenues to the province, uh, the, uh, well, predominantly the revenues to the province, the jobs didn't change based on oil price. So the revenues to the province would change, go lower at lower oil prices, go higher. But what I will say is that I don't think that we fully accounted for all of the costs. I think that in reality, the cost to develop, you know, the well, the type of wells that we, we modeled the simplest of well, right? A simple well that goes down and then goes out for two kilometers. This lateral well, the directional drilling is a more expensive well to drill. So, um, you know, I, I'd say we, we were, we were the most conservative in terms of our estimates. I think everything else will be getting more expensive to develop, and the volume of oil multiplied by the dollars per barrel is what the prize is. Do that doesn't get better because your prices have gone up to develop. So I, do I don't know what, what would be economic problem. I say that whoever, you know, any project would need to do a lot more than we did to reach that decision. Wade? And, and there are a lot of costs that could have been put in that weren't Absolutely. put in. Absolutely. And so if you had to pay for those out of the, out of the benefits of the project, you would require a lot more in terms of price Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Uh, Ray, thanks for the talk. This, this last comments you made, the, uh, I was involved a little bit one time in a group of engineers and non-engineers getting together and talking about a the, the sort of confluence of technical challenges, social challenges, environmental challenges, uh, local people, political issues, all together. And you, it certainly made me realize how challenging a project becomes, you know, with the multiple aspects of it. Um, I'm just wondering if you've got any more thoughts in terms of is this, is this really something that could change, say, an undergraduate engineering program? Is it something that you know, uh, is more like continuing education that engineers should do, and and you know, is there a? It sounds like you've had a, a, a nice experience with it, so it it doesn't just become a yelling match. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think the panel the panel worked really well together, and so the the interdisciplinary nature of the panel and the personalities, I mean, it worked wonderfully, which. This could have been a disaster if you had a fractured panel and, and agendas. So it was the only agenda we all had was we felt we were given a question from government that we all understood or felt comfortable that government wanted us to address it to the best we could and give an honest answer. And you know we debated lots of things, but it was I think we all had a sense it was to get to to the honest answer and a, and a consensus. This was a the, con, the the outcome of this was a con, was a report that was a consensus. What I will say is I don't know how from the you know the question okay I'm an engineer. I don't know how, what you could really do in an engineering program beyond raise the awareness that these factors are going to dominate in all likelihood what you'll be doing, right? And so I just don't think there's enough in the program now that let the engineers understand that this will become 
and can become quite quickly a dominating factor in what they will have to deal with as their careers unfold. But you, I don't think you could ever put enough preparation to be able to get into this. But you, I think we could do more to raise the awareness. So you could have all the work. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. Yeah. The way the biggest controversy was the naming of the report. Right? That's right. You want to tell the story? <laughs> no, no, no. You, 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 you put it there. So Wade had Wade wanted the title, uh, not not now. not now, but not no. <laughs> and uh, we tried it out on our on our. Uh, well, that was the main question that the the peer review panel was asked, and uh, they didn't really. Uh, did, not that he went for it, Wade. No. <laughs> we survived it, though. <laughs> we have a much better chance. Yes. Two questions, Ray. Uh, sure. One uh, is, uh, did you hear from the proponent? And what was the proponent's reaction? I don't think I heard that. And uh, the second uh, question, more comment, really, is uh, moving from environmental assessment to impact assessment. Uh, do you think that will re-engage the public uh, generically across a whole range of projects? Is, is that the way of the future, you think? OK, so the first question about the proponent. Uh, what I will say is you know, um, we engaged the full spectrum in our, um, you know, as we did our work. And I think you know, we needed people to engage and be open with us, um, whether they were the opponents or the proponent. Uh, the proponent, I mean, there was, a, there was really only one company with who you could define as the proponent. I mean, they were, there were other companies, but some of them just stayed out. But one, Showpoint Energy, um, who holds the license, did engage fully with us. I mean, they cooperated with anything we asked and met with us several times. Um, and I have nothing but positive things to say about whoever engaged us, in fact. I mean, sometimes it was emotional, but it, I think in the end it was respectful, including the proponent. After the report was out, I think the proponent really, it, it probably affected that little company, you know, uh, in a major, major way. And they, they couldn't have been happy with it. Uh, it wasn't what they wanted. Um, they, so the press that sort of they engaged with after did attempt to discredit the panel, I mean, discredit the report, right? It, it called for a different outcome. It tried to point to different parts of the report saying different things. I understand why. I mean, it's, they have to survive. But it's, you know, I expect uh, at some point we'll cross paths with the proponent and he will be every bit as nice. He was a nice fellow. Yeah. Uh, the second question, sorry, on the uh, EA versus impact assessment. Will it, um, I don't know if, it, I mean, it depends on how they do it, right? I mean, you know, regaining the public confidence will require you know, government and whoever carries out the EAs on their behalf and uh, the companies that are involved to behave differently, I think. And so whether you're looking at environmental or a broader range of issues, if you don't go into it differently than I think some of the experiences have been that have caused people to, to be suspicious of the process, then nothing will change. So I don't know that the uh, simply changing the name or broadening the scope will solve what is the public confidence problem. But perhaps a recognition that there are broader issues that are of concern to people, and then figuring out a process that engages with them you know, respectfully and maybe differently, and that may be the start of a rebuilding. But it will take, it, my guess is it will take time. This particular, you know, the re-engagement in Western Newfoundland on fracking is going to take, require a different approach from whoever the proponent of what, you know, at some point in the future, if there is one, will require a different approach than was taken to date. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ray. I have two questions. But sure. firstly, congratulations on a on a very well present, well presented, a summary of your of your activities and for perhaps uh, destroying some of the myths about West West Coast Newfoundland. But two questions. One relates to the the quality of the oil. If we assume that Hibernia Terranova de with the exception that Hebron is 37 degree. Uh, what it was the quality of the oil on the west coast and my second question relates to the associated gas is there any economic develop economic uh, benefit of the gas or would it be basically reinjected for reservoir stimulation is there no you can't process the gas what was the GOR sort of thing yeah 
So um, I don't remember what the degree was, but I think it was characterized as light, sweet, crude in the reports, and they would have had the, the percent, and I just don't recall what it was, but the characterization was light, sweet, for sure, uh, in terms of what had been produced from the show, what had been recovered on the show point uh, well. Um, sorry, your second question? Gas oil. Oh, gas oil, yeah, yeah. So uh, I forget what I had up there. It was something like 150 million barrels of oil and 75, uh, maybe 75 billion cubic feet. Was that right? I think that's what I had up. I don't. But anyway, that that was not a gas project, right? What we did was in our model, we looked at using that gas uh, from that project to as a local energy source. Right, so it wasn't going to be reinjected. It would be utilized, you know, so as a power source. Having any economic value? Not it, you use a power well, it would. Sure, that's economic value. I mean, if you had a, if you had more than a project and you had a an industry, you would be generating a lot more gas, and then you would look at utilizing it differently. I mean, we spoke to that in the report, but we didn't model it or try. But at 75, whatever it was, billion cubic feet, that that was not. Uh, you know that was not an energy project, right? We we looked at building a power plant and using it locally to generate some power to support actually the development. Yeah, the uh, yeah. I mean, the report has a, a a cost in for the generating station. I just don't remember what it is. Yeah, it yeah it's in the main report. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. In fact, uh, it's honor for me to be part of this report because I worked with uh, Dr. Tahir Hussain oh, to put together uh, air quality and uh, yes. water. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to see the big picture now because I didn't have that uh, yeah. big picture. Yeah. So my quick question is, uh, you said that you had town hall meetings in port -a port and other cities. Yes. Just curious to know what was the kind of public opinion with regards to what percent in favor and what against, something like that? Yes, sorry, I said I was going to tell you about the, uh, the relationship between the what feedback we got, including from the sessions, and then the survey. So the public sessions were um, uh, almost unanimously opposed to hydraulic fracturing. 